Healthcare is changing, and Dr. Nancy R.N. is here for you. The topics are many, but each program stands on its own with three key action points for you to learn. Your guide to a healthier you in a changing world. Dr. Nancy R.N. Welcome to Dr. Nancy R.N. Healthy world, healthy patient, healthy you. I'm Nancy Valentine, PhD and registered nurse, and this show is dedicated to you, the healthcare consumer. Now in this new healthcare world, you as the patient and your family members as well, will need to be more informed about your own health and more educated about your own health and condition so that you can take more responsibility for getting the results that you need to get in order to remain healthy and have a happy life. Now our uh, educational person that we have today is going to be talking with us about how that can be more effective. So the title of our show is, Hey Doc, Give Me a Little Credit. Patient Engagement in Health Education from the Patient's Point of View. Now let me review the three key points that you're going to take away from this show today. You're going to recognize that the dependence model of the current healthcare system is quickly going to be replaced with a new model. And in this new model, you and your doctor and other educators are going to really have to have a partnership and have this more as a team effort, as collaborators. Physicians and others who are involved in teaching are going to need to recognize more fully and allow patients to ha be given more credit for what they already know and how they can already participate in their own health and wellness by using the baseline that they come with. So seeing patients as partners, but not just as receptors of information that you have to give them. The third key point is that through this new collaborative engagement and model between patients and their team of providers, all of whom many times are involved in some aspect of education, are going to be able to have a new approach so that the outcome of this is that patients will have a deeper knowledge and be an understanding and thereby a better commitment to making the kind of behavioral changes that they're going to need to make in order to get the improvements that we all seek together. So in order to really understand this, we have a wonderful healthcare expert who really doesn't come with a clinical background per se. I'd like to welcome our guest today, a friend and colleague of mine, Dr. Sylvia Arufo, who is visiting with us in Philadelphia today from her home in Chicago, Illinois. Sylvia is the CEO of a wonderful company called Communication Science. Now just the title alone tells you that there is science in back of the kind of work that they do. This company is dedicated to patient education from the patient's point of view and she's going to tell you how they actually do that work. Now before she got involved with communication science she was working for the World Health Organization and she was working in health literacy which is really again helping people to understand health and very complex concepts in down-to-earth language. Before that she originally started her career in understanding the consumer experience at companies such as General Motors and Pepsi-Cola. Sylvia is very well trained. She has a PhD in ethno-linguistics. I'm glad I could say that. Um, she has an MBA and her undergraduate degree is in behavioral science. So she comes with a very rich background that she has put together in other forums such as business but has really for most of her career now taken it into the healthcare arena. So I want to thank you, Sylvia, for, for being with us today and for helping us to understand this new model. So maybe we could start with uh, what you were saying about the more traditional model and really how we're going to transition from what we have today to what the future is going to look like. Sure. The traditional model we've had is very much a two-mindset model where the doctor has all the knowledge and thinks of the patient as an empty vessel that the doctor is going to pour this new knowledge into. That's a mindset that we do want to leave behind. It keeps the two very distant and it also sets up a very unpleasant paradigm that neither person wants and that is when a doctor, a nurse, any provider starts to talk to you like a father figure or a dictator or a teacher of this is what you must do and you should do this and you should do that. Those are the very things that any human being has a response of, 
I don't want to do that. There's resistance automatically when you hear the word should. And I think most anyone listening can relate to that and say, yeah, I've had that experience. So what we want to do is to try to start breaking down that model. And in order to do that, we can't just in a vacuum say, okay, drop it. What we have to do is to find some common ground. And in order to find that common ground, we've been using a new type of research in healthcare, one that we used extensively in consumer products, as, as you mentioned with General Motors and Pepsi-Cola, a lot of consumer products companies. In fact, it's the state of the art in engaging a consumer in consumer products at this new kind of research. Don't know if you wanted to make a comment about that before we, I launch into an, an explanation about it. Well, I think that many of our listeners are also uh, healthcare providers, uh, and I think that it would be of interest to, for us to clarify. You know, many times physicians, nurses, uh, other people on the team, they feel that they're so hurried. There are two issues. Uh, One true. is that they're very hurried. They, you know, patient education is usually like the last thing on the mm -hmm. list, uh, although people recognize that it's important. But then I think the other factor, other than feeling hurried, is that there is, there's an urgency for people, yes. the patients, to make some of these changes because mm -hmm. if you don't uh, do certain things, you're not going to get the results. So, so right. with this new model that you're going to be educating us about today, Sylvia, yes. Do you think that, that providers can get sort of over those two hurdles? I mean, people are really going to have to understand what the buy-in is to really change this model. Absolutely, the, and the buy-in is on both sides. And that's really why we're looking for the common ground. Because until you see it, until you say, oh, I get it, nothing's really going to change. Mm -hmm. You're just going to try to do more faster and have an even stronger set of resistances. We know from all the, the literature, all the research, from the data out of the drugstores, the, the, this data is widely available, that 70% of people don't take their pills, for example. So we're, although there is an urgency, we've got to think about what's going to be most effective. Where are we really going to succeed? And that's where we've brought in this new kind of research. It is called ethnography. I have a team of anthropologists. I probably should have said earlier that in addition to my behavioral science undergrad, I also have an undergrad in anthropology. Okay. So I have a team of medical anthropologists. Now tell us what a medical anthropologist is, because some people will never have heard that term before. <laughs> True. But I think you, everyone has heard of an anthropologist. Say Margaret Mead right. went to the Trobriand Islands in the South Pacific. It used to be that anthropology was just something done on faraway cultures that are exotic. But now we can use those same techniques on groups within our own culture looking for beliefs, values, priorities, the same things that Margaret Mead used to find in the islanders, we can find are shared in groups or subgroups within our own population. So that's what I do with my medical anthropologists. These are specialists who go in to patients' homes, mm -hmm. It's, this is not a focus group. This is not where you bring a patient into a conference room and have a leader ask questions. This is just like Margaret Mead going out to the patient's home as the island and observing, listening, and then debriefing. This is not an, an interview. This is watching how the person lives their life, shadowing them at home, at work, in the community, going to church or temple or whatever with them, whatever is their life, you shadow them and find out what it means to them. Particularly, you're looking for their decision-making processes. Mm -hmm. On every project we do, we always make a chart of the decision-making with respect to a medical process or a treatment, any choice that they have. How do they go about making that decision? And what are the critical points where the decision can go off in an undesirable direction. So those are the points where we should intervene. 
That, that is marvelous because I think that that tells you there is a science to communication because all science starts with observation and then another step in the scientific process is to really keep track of those observations and to see the trends and to see you know what sort of pops out as the takeaways, as, as the, really the lessons learned. So the other thing I think that's really important to point out about what Sylvia has to offer us today is that the healthcare uh, system in general has been criticized, and I'm sure you've heard about this in many, many different ways, about not really taking up some of the learnings that other industries have had and applying them to our industry. So I think that this is fascinating mm -hmm. that we've got a scientist from another set of uh, backgrounds and fields pulling those together and really helping us as both consumers and as providers to have a deeper appreciation for how we can be more effective if we are giving education and how we can be a better receptor, so to speak, or learner, a more, uh, not a receptor like you're just uh -huh. sitting there, but, but more of an active participant in your own learning process. So, so maybe you could demonstrate this to us. Well, I would say that probably the most important learning that our researchers brought back, now I've, we've been doing this for 15 years, and I would say right at the top of the list is that when you watch what people do after they've been diagnosed, they receive some information, they get some directives from their provider, what they immediately begin to do is experiment. Okay. They don't just accept what's told to them, or even if they accept it for a short time, after a while, they've got to experiment. And I would like to share with you a clip, a video of someone talking in their home about their own experience of having been diagnosed with diabetes. And because this is, is a summary of it all, of what it means to do your own experiments. So you're saying we're all scientists in our own way. Exactly, and okay. I'm going to talk a lot more about that in a few minutes. Okay, so let's take a look at this clip. Thank you. And what you take into your body is what your body becomes. Because I've eaten junk, and I felt really, really miserable. Then I would eat, one day I, I almost, I was like, like a vegetarian, I ate vegetables, tofu, I got tofu noodles there, Japanese noodles there, and it made a big difference. I felt good. I actually tried it myself. I experimented. You know, I got a McDonald's hamburger with fries, and the next day I was tired and weak. The next day I ate vegetables and stuff. Um, I, ate, I had veggie meatballs with sauce, and I felt really good, and I didn't eat them all. I only ate, had like four, several portions of them, and I felt great the next day. You know? I did, my, I did my own experiment. I did my own experiment. That's the only way you're going to learn because you're proving it to yourself. I couldn't walk. I noticed one thing. Every time I don't do something right, my legs hurt more. I hate it. I hate it with a passion. I hate having it. I hate living with it. Um, it made my life upside down. My life is still upside down. Because I can't, um, as a man, it cut me in half. Completely in half. Because I can't do what I, what, I, what I generally do to make good money. You know? I can't put sheetrock. I can't put taping. I can't get on my knees because I have a hard time getting up. I can't get on a ladder. I can't paint. That's why I made most of my money painting. You know? And my body's a lot weaker. So it does cut you in half. Now that's interesting. Any comments on that? Yes, I think you can see that when we're talking about experiments, there's where we can begin to have some common ground with doctors. And what I would like doctors, nurses, anyone who's a clinician to step back and think about for a moment is that every bit of those decisions, those pieces of information, the directives that are given to a patient are all based on experiments. Mm -hmm. They may be experiments done by other scientists that have gone through the FDA or through a process of approval by other peers, but all of them are based on experiments. They're, and what we need to understand about experiments is that there's always a new one. Every year, there'll be a new experiment that begins to challenge the one before it.
So the knowledge body in healthcare is not a fixed entity that simply is delivered to the patient, but it's a constantly growing and changing thing. Mm -hmm. The standards are changing from one year to the next. There may be different levels of, say, hypertension. What's normal? What isn't normal? Should eat this? Shouldn't eat that? That can be very confusing to people. Absolutely. And so the only way to really come at it is to embrace it. Mm -hmm. That the scientific community is constantly experimenting and what I would like to see the scientific community, the clinical community do, is to accommodate the idea that the patient will be experimenting too. So do you think that uh, providers of education should be asking uh, our patients about what kind of experiments are they doing? Absolutely. Having more of a dialogue about Absolutely. it. Absolutely. Have you tried something? Yep. Have you done this? Yep. So, so how would someone proceed with that? Well, the way I would like to think about it is that the provider would begin to think about how they could help the patient to do a better job with their experiments. That the patient doesn't always know what to experiment with or how to set up an experiment well or even how to interpret it well at the end. What I would like to see happen is that a provider says, for example, you've been diagnosed with hypertension. One of the directives that I'm tempted to give you is don't eat more than 1,500 milligrams of sodium a day. Which most people don't know what that means anyway. Exactly. Right. But even if I tell you that that is a heaping half teaspoon, well, most of that is in your food. So let's approach this as if I think and know that you will be experimenting. No one wants to give up all salt just like that because the doctor said so or because right. the nurse said so. But let's try it. That 1,500 milligrams is actually one of those clinical standards that has changed in the last few years. Mm -hmm. it used to be 2,300. Now they're saying 1,500. Mm -hmm. Let's acknowledge that there is some variability here. And let's try this. Say I'm your doctor and I write your prescription for a pill or two that will bring down your blood pressure. Now to do a good experiment, you want to get control. So let's take the pill and eliminate all salt for a couple of weeks. Do your best to eliminate all salt and get your blood pressure down where the doctor tells you it ought to be. Mm -hmm. Now, let's experiment. Let's bring back a little bit of salt at a time and watch how that impacts your blood pressure. For example, I have here a paper log book. You could certainly do it online on, with an app, but what you want to do is to measure Get your number. You have to know those numbers. This, what I'm challenging patients to do is to become more scientific about their experiments. I have listened to hundreds and hundreds of patients talk about their experiments and share conclusions that they've drawn that are so sad. For example, a woman told me that she experimented with rice and said if she boils it long enough, it doesn't have any carbs in it anymore and she can eat as much as she likes. She needs some help in mm -hmm. interpreting her results and setting up a good experiment. This is what I want a logbook to be designed to do. But, but in this logbook, as we can see, you would, you would know your numbers because you would be taking the logbook with you to your doctor. You can fill Absolutely. it in right there. Well, you can certainly fill it in with your baseline number. Right. Then as you take your pills and eliminate salt for those first couple of weeks, you, you'll get that number down where it should be. Once it's where it should be, then you can start taking some action. Try a little bit of salt. Measure your, your blood pressure. Did it have an impact? Try a little bit more salt if it didn't. And little by little understand what happens to your blood pressure if you eat that bag of potato chips, if you have that slice of pizza, 
what happens to your specific blood pressure. Then you have proved it to yourself that salt makes a difference. Right. Now and let me exactly how much difference. That that's a very good example. And let me just go back and walk through. When we said that it's a dependent healthcare system now, what we mean by that is that if you were let's just use the same example, told to eliminate salt. Most people just don't do anything. They don't necessarily eliminate it. Uh, and if they eliminate if the few that are very compliant that would actually go home and stop using salt altogether, don't have this like wiggle room that they could now have if they were able to take more active uh, uh, engagement in their own health. But it does take work. So not only is it a different conversation that say your treatment team is going to have with you, it requires that you have some tools um, that, that and, and Sylvia will talk a little bit about the fact that her company actually provides these kinds of tools. But having something just as simple as a log book, a blood pressure cuff, some understanding of how these numbers sync up with your behavior, that is a difference. That is difference between being dependent, like, okay, I'm not supposed to have salt, the doctor told me so, but I'm like some days doing it and lots of days I don't do it. Um, that's very different than you on a daily basis, taking the time and paying attention to what this one behavior can do for your health. And in this case with high blood pressure, uh, which is related often to other areas of heart disease, can be a very critical factor about whether you are stable or the next thing, you wind up in the emergency room because you're having all kinds of bad symptoms because you weren't experimenting. So this experimentation is, is very healthy and very important for you to engage in, and it's really not that hard. Anyone can do this. Yes, that's absolutely true. The, the part I'm very glad you mentioned again is about the dependence because any traditional logbook that you see will ask you simply to list numbers not to interpret them, it will not be set up so that you can make a correlation or cause and effect between your behavior and your number. It simply is, here, bring your numbers in and let the doctor interpret it. That's a dependence model and we want to move to a more independent one which means you do your experiments and you see the cause and effect. Right. So it really changes the dialogue uh, potentially yes. because instead of you going back for your return visit and the doctor saying, how are you doing, for instance, with, with no salt, you can say, well, let me show you my logbook. This is what I've done. These, this is really where I have seen a difference or I you know, met my goal, I didn't meet my goal. That is a totally different conversation than saying, oh yeah, I've, I've, li I've eliminated salt. When Probably you haven't, um, <laughs> right. and you know it just, it's just really hard for, for doctors, nurses, and, and anyone, nutritionists who are working with you, to really have a solid understanding of really what is your experience, unless you are involved in tracking on some of this. So, exactly. So let's go on. Okay, okay. So people are having experiments, then yes. what? Hopefully, hopefully they're, they're having a good result from it. Right, and then they're going to absorb it more definitely into their behavior on a long-term basis. Mm -hmm. Even on a short-term basis, say you go to a party and there's the pizza and the chips and the dip. Yes, you can indulge, but you're going to know exactly how it's going to impact you. Mm -hmm. and, and maybe you'll indulge less. Oh, indeed, right. It's like, it's like the gym. You know, when I look at that brownie, I, <laughs> I, I know that's 45 minutes on the treadmill. Right. So do I really want that brownie that mm -hmm. much because mm -hmm. maybe I can't get to the gym for 45 yeah. minutes. So you, you start making those, those um, much more informed packs decisions. with yourself, more, informed, more informed decisions. decisions. And, and you're having those conversations mm -hmm. with yourself that yes. you wouldn't have yes. if you weren't keeping track of your behavior. Now what I'd like to share with you is what I hope will be some great inspiration on why you want to do this and why you want to step up to the plate and take more responsibility. As I mentioned earlier, when we do our anthropological research and we shadow the patients, one of the things that we do always is to go with the patients to their doctor's visits. We observe, we, we say we're a family member or a friend and we just observe what happens. And then we debrief with the patient 
afterward. Now let me just just stop because most people won't understand that the reason that you're doing this is really so that you have that information so you can develop these tools. Absolutely, yes. So we're not talking about someone going with you for your visit to have this debriefing on a one-on-one -on -one basis, you know, to sort of coach you. I mean, oh, I suppose no, that, you know, true. that could that could happen in certain situations, yeah. but that's yeah. not really what Sylvia is talking about in this particular program. She's talking about how they have really had to go out to homes, to offices, as she said earlier, to, to really walk in the shoes of the patient. Because once they do that, they can then come back with that information and sit down and really develop tools that they know people will use because they will fit in and slide right in to their daily life. Right. Now, one of the, one of the research projects we did that was slightly different, not exactly ethnography, it's called a standardized patient. It's very similar in that I send an anthropologist to watch what happens in an interaction. Here's what we did. First of all, we hired four actors, but we insisted that all four actors have full-blown diabetes themselves. Then each of those actors, accompanied by an anthropologist, went to a doctor visit. The doctor knew what was going to happen. The patient, all four of them, had the same scripted story that they had been diabetic for three years, that their A1C score was nine, that they had consistently had that score for the three years. And then the idea was presenting that to the doctor, what would the doctor advise the person to do oh, if no. that person was truly coming in to be one of their patients? So th these were four different actors and yes. four different doctors. A hundred different doctors. Oh, so four covered a hundred different yes. doctors. Each so one went to 25 doctors. All doctors got a ch a, the same chance at this. Yes. But I think you're going to tell us about what the different responses you were. You got it. What happened was, if you can see the um, paradigm on your screen, we found that there were four different responses, two dimensions that intersected. The first that was critical was, was that doctor optimistic or pessimistic about your ability to rise to the challenge and make behavior change? We found that a number of them were not and, and, and others were. Now, uh, let me just stop you. Okay. Often, that is a very subtle kind of thing. Very subtle. Yes. It's not like the doctor or, or nurse, as I said, any, anyone says, I don't think you're going to make it, so I'm just going to give you this material and, you know, good luck to you. Yes. It's, it's very, un it's almost unconscious. Oh, absolutely it is. It's at the level of assumption. Then another dimension that we found varied was how many pills a doctor would prescribe on the first visit. Some start right out with many pills and others just start with one. So that's the paradigm that you see on your screen. Now I'd like to tell you what the numbers were. Okay. In the box where the intersection was between pessimism and many pills, 36% of the doctors fell into that category out of the 100. 36 of them. So that's about a little more than a third. That's right. Then uh, the next cat, I, I'm sorry, I think it was 32%. Thir so almost a third. Okay, all yeah, right. Close let's, let's not okay. split hairs on a few numbers. Then, uh, but the numbers are on the screen. Then it was 26% who were, had a little more optimism, but they still prescribed a great many pills for you. Three, four, five pills to start. Then there were people that believed that nothing you could do would prevent your degeneration and they just gave you one pill. Then there were the people that were very optimistic and said, I know you can do it, but I'm going to give you one pill as a boost to get you started. So you can see those numbers and how they laid out a hundred doctors responding to exactly the same situation and they were all over the map. In fact, if anything is statistical, 
most of them were pessimistic in giving you a lot of pills to start. I hope that this is inspiration to take charge. Do you want to be taking a lot of pills? Because the highest probability is that you'll walk out of the doctor's office with more pills than you want. Or maybe even need. Or even need. Our actors in this research project, we debriefed with the doctors afterward, and that's how we found out about their assumptions. And we did that privately. The actors were not present. And then we debriefed with the, doc with the actors because they, in fact, have diabetes. And they were astonished. None of the four actors had ever, ever thought to challenge what their doctor had prescribed for them or what their doc doctor recommended to them. And all of them said, I'm going to go get a second opinion and maybe a third. Well, I think that in closing, we have learned a lot today, which is really just the tip of the iceberg. We've learned that in this changing healthcare world, there are other people coming into our world that are really helping us to have a deeper dive and understand some of the complexities in this case around patient education. We've learned with, from Sylvia just in that last experimental design that it is complex and emotions do play a big role in this. So I think it's a combination of being alert to the fact that you do need to be, as a consumer, much more engaged in your own health care. And that does often start with patient education. It's also, I, I think, a heads up to all of us that are healthcare providers that we need some education as well. We need to understand how to really be more effective in our role. We do spend time and money on education, and we really want to make it better. We don't want to be talking about our patients as non-compliant. We want to be cheerleading them on and seeing the kind of results that only they can get. We are facilitators in this process, and I want to thank Sylvia Rufo for being with us today to help us be better, and she's cheerleading us on to the future. Thank you very much for being with us. Have a wonderful day. I hope you enjoyed our conversation today and that the information will help you in meeting your health goals. Catch this program and other conversations on the website, drnancyrn.com, or you can write to me as well. I welcome your comments and feedback. Thank you for listening and join us again. And remember, with health, all things are possible.